The Lord is here. Let's pray. Lord, may your word be our rule. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher. And may your greater glory be our supreme concern. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, last week, as we looked at Lead Us Not Into Temptation, we saw how this is linked to today's subject, but deliver us from the evil one. In other words, don't lead us into temptation. Do deliver us from the evil one. And we looked at how Lead Us Not Into Temptation was a prayer of God's mercy, amongst other things. That we wouldn't be placed in a situation where we might fall or fail. That the Lord would keep us from that in his mercy. And even though God will test us, the scripture says he will, we pray that we wouldn't fall away and give in to temptation when we're tested. We looked at the example of Job who lost everything it seemed, yet still refused his wife's encouragement to give up on his trust in God. However tempting, and we looked at King David who put himself in temptation's way and then made disastrous decisions as a result. And then we saw Esau, for the sake of food for his stomach, forfeited his birthright. The temptations of our physical appetites. And we saw that God though he will test us, will never tempt us. And that it is the devil that will tempt us. That the Lord will test us for our good, that we might grow in maturity, character, perseverance and hope. Because our faith has been refined through the fire of tough times. But that the devil wants to tempt us Not test us, tempt us into forfeiting all that God has given us. That he's our enemy who wants to destroy us. That the devil is the tempter. That's what it says in scripture, New Testament. Whom Jesus described as a thief who comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. And we also saw that while Jesus Christ intercedes, the Lord intercedes, On our behalf before our Father, God in heaven, the devil accuses God's people. He's the accuser of the brethren, accusing them day and night before God. And this morning we come to another distinction. We talked about testing and temptation last week. We come to another distinction this morning. That God brings conviction upon us. Why? So that we might recognize sin and do something about it. It's to lead to a good place. While the devil tries to bring condemnation, not conviction, condemnation upon God's people. So that we might stay down, stay defeated and don't get back up when we fall or get up a lot slower than we need to. And scripture tells us that This is the uh, Apostle John writing in John chapter 3. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it. He He didn't send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, through Christ. So there we have it. You know, in Romans there's no condemnation in Christ. Here we have the Apostle John saying that's not why he came. And here we have that uh, verse from the letter that Paul wrote to the the church in Rome where in chapter 8 verse 1 he says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is it's so important for us. If you suffer from feelings of condemnation they are not from the Lord. You need to know that. I need to know that. We all need to know that any feelings of condemnation are not from the Lord. Instead, we know that condemnation comes from the enemy. And what do we mean by condemnation? Feelings like, I'm no good, I'm useless. 
I failed again. I will always fail. I don't have value. If people really knew me, they wouldn't love me. I don't feel forgiven for what I did a few years ago, 30 years ago, last year, last week. And I can't forgive myself. I don't deserve it. God doesn't love me. He can't. And uh, finally, I, I can't come to him in prayer. That's condemnation. That's not from the Lord. If you experience any of those things, know the voice. It's not God's voice. The enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. That's what Jesus said. And the results of believing this voice when it comes in our heads can be this, that when you do sin, you think, well, you know what? In for a penny, in for a pound, as the saying goes. I've done it now, I might as well just carry on. And again, it's the enemy's voice. You've done it now. Just carry on. What difference does it make? You've done it once. You've sinned. Just carry on. You'll be fine. And condemnation and the enemy's voice ultimately wants to convince you, convince me, to forfeit. Alan's the scripture, sorry, the, the, the scripture from um, uh, Alan's song, which says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. And the enemy wants you to forfeit, to give up your identity as an adopted son, as an adopted daughter of the Most High God. To convince you that you're too far gone. You've gone too far this time. And that there's no way back. That's what the enemy would like to convince you of. And you know, that's a lie. We need to see it for what it is. Jesus describes our enemy like this. Quote, Jesus' words. There is no truth in him. There is no truth in him. He's a liar. And not only that, he's the father of lies. What does a father do? The seed of a father produces children. The children of the enemy, the children of the devil, is a lie. He's the father of lies. That's what he produces. So what do we do when we're visited with feelings of condemnation and you realize you're being tempted to believe a lie from the enemy about who you are. And scripture tells us to submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. We touched upon this last week. But we, many of us sometimes, many believers try and resist the devil before submitting to God. It doesn't work. We need the Lord. We submit to God first. We need to come to him and say, Lord, I confess this, this, and whatever it is. Make your, make your peace with the Lord. Keep a short account. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And there's a promise here. He will flee. He then has got nothing on you or me. And the Apostle Paul also instructs the believers to take every thought captive to Christ. What's a captive? Someone, it's someone who's been captured. So that thought that you think, that's not, from, that's not from God. Capture it. Make it a captive to Christ. We're, thinking, we're, we're to think his thoughts. Conviction's fine. Condemnation isn't. And ask the Lord when we take these thoughts captive, we've captured it. Father, is this from you? Is this from you, Lord? Is this right? Is, is it true? And the Holy Spirit in us helps us to sift those thoughts because every Christ follower has received the Holy Spirit to, to help us tell the difference. So every thought that is bringing condemnation we recognize as not being from the Lord and we kick it into touch is the sporting term. We just kick it out. And we say... Every thought that, it, that brings conviction, that the Lord brings conviction for sin for our own good, so we recognize it. So we don't stay in danger. We recognize it from the Lord and we say, thank you, Father, for showing me that, that wrong. Forgive me. Help me not to do it. 
There is a battle of the mind which the Lord has equipped every Christ follower to win. I'm just going to say that again. There's a battle of the mind which the Lord has equipped every Christ follower to win. How are we equipped by the Lord? The scripture tells us to put on the armour of God. Ephesians 6. We'll come on to that a bit later on. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, describes what that armour of God looks like. Satan cannot fight the Lord. We need to have perspective as we pray, but deliver us from the evil one. He's a fallen angel, the scripture says, who has rebelled against God, been cast out of heaven. He was then defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. All believers, Christ followers, are in Christ and Christ is in us. You know the connection I spoke about earlier? It's always on. Christ's victory over Satan, therefore, is our victory too through Christ. We cannot be defeated in living for the Lord. We can only forfeit what is ours in Christ. There's a big difference. The enemy will try to persuade you out of your inheritance in the Lord. Like a scammer who can't take your money unless he persuades you first to give him access and authority to take what's yours. We're going to look at our earliest ancestors and the first ever recording in scripture of interaction between human beings, our ancestors, and the evil one, the enemy, described in the Bible as Satan, the devil. Our earliest ancestors, as we know, Adam and Eve, were created by the Lord, given the Garden of Eden. God gave them permission to eat the fruit of every tree, every tree in that garden, all except the fruit of one tree. And what happened next is known throughout history as the fall of man. Satan managed to deceive Adam and Eve into eating fruit from the one tree that God had instructed them not to. I'm just going to read that passage now. Now the serpent, which is the, symbol, the symbolic um, creature for the enemy, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and it was pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Genesis 3. Firstly, we notice, what did the enemy do first? He says, did God really say? And you know, the enemy of our souls first wants us to doubt God's word. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
Clearly, God didn't say, don't eat from any tree. He just said, don't eat from one. And here we have the second approach of the enemy, who wants to misrepresent or twist God's words. Eve knew what God had said. We may eat fruit, she said, from the trees in the garden. She knew that. She told it back to Satan. But God did say, she says, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. So she repeats back what she knows is God's word. But then thirdly, the enemy wants to deny the consequences of disobedience to God. You will certainly not die, he says. Oh no. You won't die. In fact, your eyes will be opened. And God knows that. He actually says here, God knows. God knows that your eyes will be opened. And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And he's coming to Eve and saying, this fruit is, is good stuff. And God knows it. Have some. Your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. You, you won't die. Eve knows what God has said. We've just seen she's repeated it back to Satan. However, temptation is growing. It says here, when she saw that the fruit of the tree, she's already told him we're not allowed from that, when she saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye. In other words, the fruit was clearly edible and it also looked attractive. And when she saw that it was also desirable for gaining wisdom, that was the final attraction. I'll know more. My eyes will be opened. I'll be like God. It was one of the arguments in the 60s and 70s about drugs. Your eyes will be opened. You'll see things that no normal person will see. God knows this, Satan had said. Eve was persuaded. Perhaps she may have thought God is keeping something good from us. Why not? Verse 6, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. What does that tell us about how we interact with the enemy when we hear those voices? Eve first engaged in conversation with Satan rather than just cutting it short. And if we do that, we're inviting Satan's lies about the truth of a situation. Eve was open to hearing what Satan had to say. There was a sense of, I'm open to persuasion. Tell me more. She listened, gave credibility to his arguments for rebelling against God. And by the end, she became convinced that there would not be any consequences if she disobeyed God and did what Satan was inviting her to do. In fact, there'd actually be some benefits from it. That's what she became convinced of by the end. And it's no different today. It's been this way throughout human history. We think that we know better than God's word to us. We say things like, yes, I know it says that, but people tell you, even friends or family, and say, look, everyone's doing it. It's, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. You'll enjoy it. Do you, honest, do you honestly believe that God wants you to be unhappy? He wants good for you. Why would he keep it from you? And notice that Satan couldn't make Eve sin. He couldn't make her do it. The choice to disobey God was always hers and Adam's. All Satan could do and all that he can do now is to persuade you and me to agree with him. And when you do, you're then obeying Satan rather than the Lord in that moment. And when you find you're preferring what Satan is saying and his temptation to sin, Know that you're beginning to serve him 
rather than the Lord. That's what the scripture says. That's what John says, Apostle John. And scripture says that God cannot be your Lord or mine if we continue in deliberate sin. It doesn't mean that we won't fall from time to time. But if we've got a lifestyle of deliberate sin, that God cannot be your Lord or mine. It's impossible. We're not serving him. We're serving the enemy who's telling us to do this instead. And Adam and Eve believed the evil one rather than God. They willingly succumbed to evil and sin was introduced to human beings, to mankind. And it was the reason that Jesus came as a human being, fully God and fully man, to reverse human disobedience with perfect obedience to save people from the power of evil. We come to Jesus and that passage in Matthew where Matthew writes this Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We looked at this last week. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. This is word for word. The tempter, again the tempter, came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, this is Matthew chapter 4 by the way. Jesus answered, it's written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he says, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This is the devil giving the Lord Jesus scripture to tempt. Notice that. He says, for it is written. This is the enemy speaking. Jesus answered him, it is also written. This is the other side, he's saying. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus meets scripture with scripture. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Everything that the world has to offer. We sometimes have a glimpse of what that might look like. All this I'll give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. I'll I'll give it all to you. It's all yours. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God. Serve him alone. And it says the devil left him. And angels came and attended the Lord Jesus. You know, the angels are not just for the Lord Jesus. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Angels are for every believer. We need to know that. And it means that we receive help. We're not on our own when we resist the enemy when he comes. What good is it in Matthew, says Jesus, will it be for someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? What what good is it? You think you've gained everything, but you've lost the most precious thing. I'm going to come on to Peter. Remember Peter that betrayed or denied Jesus? Um, uh, 
Peter said, listen, I, I, I would die for you. I would go to jail, I would die for you, he said to the Lord Jesus. And uh, Jesus said to him, he said, Peter, he said, Peter, he says, Satan has asked. Do you remember Job last week? Satan has asked. Nothing can happen unless the Lord allows it. It's the restraining hand of God for things to be not much worse than they are. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. He says, but Peter says, I prayed for you. I've prayed for you. And that's what Peter said. Listen, I'll, I'll, I'll die for you. There's no way. I, and he said, you know, you know the story. Before the cock crows twice tonight, you will have denied me three times. But he says, I prayed for you. You're going to be sifted. He's asked. You are going to be sifted. You're going to be tested last week. But I prayed for you. And we saw earlier that, that Christ intercedes for us. That's why we say, lead us not into temptation. He's our helper. But deliver us from evil instead. And then we come to... Uh, I'm going to take you to the shore of Galilee. Jesus has uh, died, is risen, and he's appearing to the disciples. And he says this. Chapter 21 of John. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Now, bearing in mind where Peter's at at this point, he's denied Jesus three times vehemently. I don't know this man. I, I, I don't know him, I tell you. He said, surely, I think you're, I'm sure we've seen you with the, with the other disciples. You're from Galilee, aren't you? I don't know him, he said. He knows he's failed the Lord. This is where he's at. And he's together with these other disciples. And this is what he says. I'm going out to fish. Word for word. I'm going out to fish. Chapter 21, verse 3. It's what he knows to do. What, what else can he do? He knows he's letting his, his master down. The other said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends. Friends, have you not got any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to to bring the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which we think is John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him because he'd taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat. So Peter's going first. They followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were about a hundred yards from the shore. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with some fish on it already. You know, Jesus doesn't need our fish, does he? He, he, he helps us. It's not because he, he needs our stuff. Everything is his. But Peter's first. The last time he had anything to do with the Lord, in his mind, seared in his memory, was that triple denial, one after the other that evening. And there he is face to face. Jesus is cooking breakfast. There's some fish and some bread. Jesus said, come and bring some of the fish you've just caught, he said. Simon Peter climbed aboard, dragged the fish, 153, full of large fish. Jesus said to them, come and have some breakfast. Come and have breakfast, he says, quote. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew that it was the Lord. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he says, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. 
Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you do you truly love me? He said, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know, this part of scripture is known as the, uh, the reinstation or, or reinstituting of, of Peter, Peter, or Jesus reinstates Peter. And when he finishes talking to him, he says, follow me. And he repeats the first follow me when he left everything to follow Jesus. You know, the, the Lord Jesus, he intercedes for us. From time to time, we will be sifted. And sometimes we're going to be found wanting. But Jesus says, I've prayed for you. And the scripture says, he's interceding for us. We have the armour of God. We, we know the difference between conviction and condemnation. We recognise the master's voice, the voice of the shepherd, compared to the voice of the thief. I'm going to finish with this verse. It's Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy's young. Paul's taught him. Timothy's got great responsibility as a young man. And at one point he says, listen, don't let everyone, anybody despise you because you're young. But he goes on to say this. He says, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. So that by recalling them, he said, you may fight the battle well. We are in a battle. We are in a fight. If we forget that, we, we won't be able to defend ourselves, as I said last week. And he said, hold on to faith and a good conscience, he said. Hold on to faith and a good conscience. The conscience is meant to guide us in the Lord. He says, which some have rejected, they've rejected faith, and they've rejected the good conscience, and they've suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. It's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. As we pray, Lord, deliver us from the evil one. We we can pray that. that the Lord has asked us. He's, you know, we, we can pray other prayers other than the Lord's Prayer, of course. But it's there as a pattern for us. It's there as a template. Whatever other prayers we pray, that we can go back and ask for forgiveness. That we can ask for our daily bread. We can ask for God's kingdom to come. His will to be done. That we can ask for these things. So it's a template. doesn't mean we can't pray any other prayers. Of course not. But we have our responsibility too. We will be approached, sometimes on a day-by-day -day basis, sometimes we feel we've not heard anything for a while, and suddenly we hear the enemy's voice to just do something, and it's strong sometimes, to just do it. Say that word that you feel like saying, that can be so cutting. Do that thing that you, you just know it's wrong. And we recognise, after all is said and done, what it feels like to... To be in condemnation when the Lord is saying, okay, okay, you've fallen. Get up. You're no good to me on the floor. Get up. You're, you're not, you can't be my ambassador or effective one if you're constantly on the floor. Get up. I'm recommissioning you. Follow me. And as many times as it takes, the Lord will always do that. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's an always-on connection. 
And Jesus said, he says, that no one can snatch them out of my hand. He said, it's God's will that I don't lose any, any of them. And that's the Lord. But we can't stay in condemnation and be effective in the Lord. What do we have to offer out in the world? If it's not the, the conviction of God going again, growing in the Holy Spirit, yes, falling, but the Lord in his grace calling us back again. And I'm not talking about that sense of where somebody, you know, I had a friend who was used to go to a Catholic church and in, in, he was about 19, 20 years of age. And he used to tell me how whatever he got up to on the weekend, he said, it's fine. He says, on Sunday, I'll go and do confession. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what the Bible is talking about. It's not talking about kidding ourselves. But if we truly come back to the Lord and say, listen, I, I'm sorry, Lord. He said, it's OK, I pray for you. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your scripture, Lord, that says that even though we may walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil because you are with us. And your rod on your staff comfort us. Thank you, Father, for this journey of life with Christ in us, the hope of glory, and us in Christ in you. Lord, lead us, we pray, as the Good Shepherd. Thank you for your voice that we recognize and the voice of the enemy that we also, I pray, Lord, will increasingly recognize. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.